that's the end of the announcements. Let me now uh, introduce today's speaker. Um, Professor Milton Fink uh, has come to uh, speak to us today about uh, transistor to, uh, to uh, light emitting transistor, and we really appreciate him coming. Let me just give you a couple of the highlights of, uh, of uh, his career. Um, he actually, before coming to the University of Illinois, um, was at Hughes Aircraft Company and Ford Microelectronics uh, Incorporated. He came here in 1991 as a, a professor of electrical and com computer engineering. Uh, he's won numerous awards, and I won't run down the list. Um, but in fact, I do want to point out one thing, which is a first for me personally in, as, as introducing all of these speakers. Professor Feng is the Nick Holniak Jr. Chair of Electrical and Computing Engineering, and in fact, very frequently when I introduce someone, they're a named chair uh, of physics or engineering or something. But this is the first time actually where the, the namee of the chair is actually with us also. Professor Nick Holniak is here, who is uh, actually, am I using that? Uh, <laughs> apologize for probably incorrectly using the term namee. I, I'm not sure if I constructed that. Uh, but one of the things, those of you who, uh, who follow these, uh, these uh, uh, issues are, uh, we'll see these folks written up uh, almost uh, seems like monthly in the, uh, in the local newspaper on uh, breakthroughs in, in uh, 100 gigahertz uh, and terahertz type transistors and light emitting transistors and it's just cutting edge research. We're very glad to have Professor Feng here. Please join me in welcoming Professor Milton Feng. Thank you very much to uh, have this opportunity uh, to give a talk here. And uh, last time I was here uh, was when I was a graduate student. And uh, uh, I was listening to uh, John Bardeen's talk in here. That was early 19, uh, in the early 1975 to uh, time frame. So, so it's a great honor to be able to here to give a talk. Uh, secondly, I want to say that actually uh, my daughter has been sitting here many times to listen to talk on, from a high school physics. And uh, at the end, she actually majored in electrical engineering, just to let you know that uh, just in case uh, you don't want to major in physics, you can always sign up with electrical engineering for that. Uh, I think electrical engineering is very close to uh, a, a lot of physics, especially in uh, device uh, integrated circuit area. So uh, I want to encourage you that not only look at our physics, but also look at our uh, device and the application on that. So, uh, so today uh, uh, we we like to talk a little bit about is that uh, transistor to transistor laser and uh, how the invention process was being uh, developed and uh, and the work on that. And uh, since uh, my daughter warned me, I should not have show any formula or equation. So I decided not to do that. Is that okay? Can you hear? Yeah. So uh, the outline uh, of today's talk, I'm going to be uh, look at a little bit of history, which is, you know, the vacuum tube, right? Initially, we have a vacuum tube, and then then, uh, then uh, to a dial, and then to a trial, and then why is vacuum tube is not continue to be used today? And uh, because the semiconductor transistor really and uh, integrated circuit really uh, revolution the, the modern electronics, and uh, so that's opened up uh, the the 20th century information technology. And uh, then uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the invention of light emitting dial LED. I guess is going to be the the one of the biggest invention right after transistor, and it's been very popularly used today and uh, for the future as well. And then we're talking about from LED to laser, and then we're talking about new invention of the light emitting transistor and later the transistor laser on that. So if you have any question, please feel free to uh, ask because uh, it's uh, interesting to, uh, to understand what a problem uh, we have. So, so actually the, the inertial, the vacuum tube is actually very interesting when I did the earlier search. Uh, that actually Thomas Edison in 1983 uh, noticed that first in a 
uh, LIBO, like 1983. He was a uh, player around with uh, LIBO, and he saw he could get current to jump from hot filament to a metal plate at the bottom. And what that means is basically Edison discovered that the uh, so-called Edison effect was that the electric current does not need a wire to move through. And that's, that's uh, the first, uh, first indication that you can have a signal to go through there without, uh, without a wire to connect it. And so that's, that's the initial uh, vacuum tube concept come from. But it take a while. It take in uh, 1904, uh, the vacuum tube dial was uh, uh, invented by uh, Fleming, uh, which is a British scientist. And uh, basically, uh, in the first Edison invention that he cannot force the, the light from uh, one place to the other place. So in this case, he can force a current in a tube to travel uh, exclusive in one direction. So he can control the current flow in a direction. So that's a, a very important discover. I mean, I can wire the direction from one A to B uh, uh, without uh, uh, changing. So he can actually turn the current on and off so that's actually the first uh, vacuum tube dial in 1904. Then uh, coming two years later, it's coming uh, D, uh, D4, Lee D4 Forest, is uh, the invention of the vacuum tube trial, which is uh, uh, equivalent to a, a three terminal uh, device, which he put a metal grid in between of the dial on the vacuum tube there, and uh, he'd be able to control the flow of a second more powerful current through the tube. Uh, because of this, that's the beginning of the uh, signal can be amplified in a device by the vacuum tube, right? But this is the greatest invention because, uh, one of the great invention because uh, uh, people begin to use this to make a radio and make a TV. And uh, I think, uh, actually, when I was a graduate student, I, I saw the TV making by two. Uh, that's pretty exciting for me. And also radio in 1960. So what's the problem? You know, if we, uh, if we are very happy we saw this uh, vacuum tube, uh, we should be, uh, we should use all the time, uh, you know, other than the, the very high power. What is the problem? Uh, one of the major problems is obviously it's not very reliable. And, uh, the second problem is a slow, you know. It's a, take a long time to turn on the system. So, uh, so there's a major problem we see here is unreliable and it taking five minutes to turn your radio on. So in 19, I remember in 1960, I have this radio too. It take five minutes to warm up and I have this TV, take a, at least 10 minutes to 20 minutes to see the first picture when I turn on. And uh, for today's standard, most of the kids want to have a six screen, seven screen open at a microsecond time. This is very slow, right? You probably did a lot of other work before you waiting for that. But uh, it take a 20 minutes, I remember that. And uh, you take a 20 minutes also. So, <laughs> so that's already 40 minutes. I don't think you can wait. This class is over already for any demonstration. So. So obviously, the problem is uh, uh, people recognize that problem, even though the, the invention is uh, 1906. There's a lot of things being made already in the 1960, 1970, actually TV, radio being made. But the problem caused it you know, in the radar and other stuff. So, so uh, Bell Lab, actually Marvin Kelly at the Bell Lab, uh, tried to formulate uh, solid state semiconductor people and try to find a new switch, semiconductor switch, to replace this uh, programmatic uh, vacuum tube system. So this is, this people compose uh, three uh, pretty brilliant scientists. One of them is uh, Bill Shockley. He was a team leader. And then uh, I think they recruit, uh, uh, Bretton's already there. I think Bodding was recruited in to uh, to get the, the theoretical background going for that. So the 
obviously uh, the inertial work on a fuel effect, uh, the inertial work on a switch was looking at the fuel effect. So fuel effect you do is you, uh, you apply an electrical field. Hopefully you can uh, change the conductivity of the system, right? So, so that's pretty, pretty simple. You got a piece of metal, you flow the electrons through the metal. If you apply electrical field, hopefully you can get deflection. And they think the same way to apply to semiconductor, hopefully they can do that fuel effect uh, device. Uh, but for all they working for a couple of years, nothing happened. Everything failed, right? You know, the device didn't work. So if you are the boss, what do you do? You, you assign a graduate student to search, right? So, so he assigned Bardeen and Breton to find out what, what's wrong, you know? How come it didn't work? You know, the idea is so simple. Why the, why the hell it didn't work? You know, so, so obviously, uh, 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 you know, body is much, much brighter than uh, Shakri, I think, you know. So, <laughs> short, short after Christmas, body has uh, insight. Every, everyone think, thought they, they knew uh, how electrons behave in crystal, but uh, body is discovered they, they, most of them are wrong because uh, the electron actually form a barrier on the surface and that's because of the bonding problem. So they have a surface state uh, preventing the conduction through there. So uh, obviously in December 16, 1947, they built the first so-called point contact transistor and uh, this is uh, the point contact transistor. You can look at that, it's a pretty Pretty, uh, pretty big size. Here, I think they're using the clip uh, to do a wire in there. There's a gold wire here connected, and this is a piece of germanium serve as a base here, so the current connect from a, from an emitter to collector. You know, the current transport from this way to this way, and there's a base here to do the base current control. So that, like the terminal, uh, you control the base current and flow the current this way on the system there. So that's first transistor work. And, and uh, it's pretty amazing if you look at this device, in a, you know, pretty, that's you know, how the invention started, yes. Oh, that's very good question. Ah, that's a metal, actually. That's it's a But, uh, you know, I, I love him, what he, ha he had to say. Right? <laughs> That's an amazing thing because mm. there is no technology. These people just do this out of their minds, out of their ability. There's no technology. There are no recipes. There's no place you can turn to see how to do this. How do you do it when there's nothing? And, and th that's remarkable. That's absolutely unbelievable. See, it's crude. It's primitive. That thing is so huge compared to an integrated circuit, it's unbelievable. Yet right. There's how it began, right there. So, so instead of uh, doing a fuel effect, they end up with a new device, uh, actually a new concept in 1947. Uh, they'd be able to, uh, to uh, you know, to show that, they'd be able to show that you can inject a carrier here and collect a carrier out through that metal, through the gold wire there. And then the, the piece of uh, semiconductor was actually germanium, and the current actually recombined here. What was interesting is, as you know, all the wire is conducting with the electron, and when they hit the semiconductor, they actually inject a hole, right? <coughs> so, so they actually flow the hole here instead of electron. So the semiconductor have electron and a hole here. And uh, that's really amazing because now you have uh, electron recombined through the base to recombine hole, and you have a hole to flow through the device here. So, so if you look at this material, it's an N-type semiconductor, that means a semiconductor, but you have a minority carry injection into the system. So that's the first time you observe the minority carry injection into the system and be able to have charging neutrality in 10. Uh, that's the, the amazing thing that was interpreted by John Bardin. Uh, uh, so the, the transistor actually was uh, accidentally uh, discovered 
and uh, but the interpretation was from uh, Bardeen and uh, which results into the real transistor work uh, after that. So I just want to say that uh, uh, when you do uh, experimental work, you fail a lot. But you just that one time you did accidentally right, you may discover something new. Okay, so it's not always uh, people sort ahead of time, every detail and uh, and everything going to happen that way. But uh, actually, you know, they try to do field effect. They end up in, into a minority carrier injection device, and they invent a transistor for that. For that wonderful idea, they got a Nobel Prize in, you know, the, the, the I think they got the first Nobel Prize in uh, 1950, is that 1956, right, correct, the transistor. And, uh, and uh, later, of course, John Bardeen was here to uh, develop the BC, BCS theory, the theory of superconductivity. He got the second Nobel Prize and he's the only person uh, so far got uh, two Nobel Prizes in the same field. So. He's a great man for that. And uh, the team, people, which he has is, uh, uh, I think is uh, the body when he was young here, and uh, I think uh, Breton is his uh, partner, experimental person. Bill Shack is his team leader, and uh, so three of them uh, received the Nobel Prize. Now. So just remember that lousy picture you see on my device. And that's a Nobel Prize winner idea, okay. So it's not a very sophisticated, people think about the idea for that. So I just want to show you another one, which is pretty ugly also here. That's an integrated circuit invention, right? So in, in 1958, Jack Kelby basically uh, at the TI, Texas Instrument, and uh, and I do is uh, uh, try to uh, make a couple of transistors and build them together to integrate into a crystal. And uh, so, so he talked to his boss, and his boss said, well, go ahead, do it. And uh, so this is the first uh, device, which is a wire jump, a couple of uh, plates of the connecting the couple of transistors together, and they form an integrated circuit. So that's the first solid state circuit, and uh, it's, Reasonable small, but actually it's fairly big. The first time in uh, March 1956, but uh, the, the TIs file a lot of patent on that. So they end up as a uh, owner of the integrated circuit patent uh, on Jack Kelby. But again, I want to show you, it's pretty crude in an uh, earlier day how people did experiment, right? Uh, but you know, integrated circuit today is a big, big game for work. So. For his work, he actually graduated from uh, our department, electrical engineering, uh, in 1947. He's, he's a pretty old guy at that time. Uh, 2000 uh, Nobel Prize in physics. He, he's probably the only few people did not get any PhD degree and got a Nobel Prize for, for physics. So the, the birth of uh, integrated circuit of the after, after the invention of transistor, probably also one of the uh, most of uh, technology I see there, the other one which a lot of this uh, computer uh, probe, medical diagnostic tool, and uh, watch, and also uh, information technology today on that. So, so coming to uh, transistor to integrate circuit, and uh, you already see there's a lot of opportunity for everybody to uh, work on that, and uh, basically the modernization, electrical engineering, beginning by the invention of the transistor, and later into, into integrated circuit. So today, it represented over, over uh, several hundred billion dollars of business in the world, created a job opportunity for every world. It's very uh, to modernize the world today. So today, if you uh, don't have a transistor, you probably uh, have to turn your cars and uh, moving around, and uh, probably, probably we're still in the dark age on a lot of things, which we do. So obviously, just to get into integrated circuit, and uh, initially there's uh, Intel Corporation and uh, TI, uh, who, uh, as you guys know, mo both company is uh, fairly big. They're, and they also get a lot of money, but the, the, 
the inventor, which is Bardin, Bratton, and Sharkey, uh, I don't think they make a lot of money. They, they, they probably play a lot of golf, right? <laughs> They're pretty happy here. They, they do that, but uh, actually, there's a lot of money being made uh, uh, in this uh, integrated circuit world, and uh, it's uh, going on. I think in University of Illinois, really on every aspect of it, STI and Intel. So, uh, well, unfortunately, I show a first equation here, which I don't like to do. Uh, but, but we turn to a, a next device, right? What after transistor? Next important device, obviously. Uh, uh, you know, you got an electron, you got a hole, you got amplification of the signal, and the uh, next important thing obviously is the emission of uh, light. And so, so it's called photonic device, the radiative uh, transition uh, from, uh, from, from a semiconductor. So we have a semiconductor can do amplify, we also have semiconductor can pull a light. So what we do is uh, we have two processes allow you to uh, to uh, emission the light. One is your electron in a high charge state. So if you have an electron in a conduction band, a hole in a valence band, you can have a light out. And the other important process is if you can trap all this light and, uh, and making a cavity, allow them to continue to circle themselves, then you can make a coherent out of it, then you can make a stimulant emission, which will give you a uh, laser beam light out. So that's the two major processes to uh, for, uh, emission of the light out of the semiconductor. And that's turned out to be very important, right? Because the first most important uh, is LED, right? You know, as you know, LED is the ultimate lamp. It's going to be ultimate lamp. It's going to be revolution the lighting industry, right? And uh, the white LED require LED of red, green, blue put together, and they are three times as efficient as an incandescent lamp. All right, so, and uh, don't, don't bother to read the equation because that's probably when you come to uh, college, then you can read more about the equation, right, so. But just for you to know, uh, the process of this is, uh, is amazing. Like uh, the device you invented, uh, uh, earlier day and it can be used over 100 years. And uh, that's how ima amazing <laughs> this stuff is. So here's an inventor, LED inventor, and uh, Nick Hoenig Jr. in 1962. Uh, a lighter emitting dial, LED is a semiconductor device that's incoherent, narrowing spectrum light uh, when electrically biased uh, forward direction. And uh, Professor Honiak actually is here. and. Uh, uh, we're very fortunate to have a people like that at uh, this campus, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He's both a professor at uh, uh, electrical engineering and also uh, physics. I guess he's a first jump out in uh, student and also first jump out in professor, chair professor of uh, both ECE and the uh, physics department. So, so thanks for Professor Honig invented in 1962. And today we still use all the light uh, based on his, his uh, early invention on that. And uh, I think I wanted to uh, show you a, a little bit of demonstration on uh, today's light. Uh, and let me show you how bright the light is. Uh, if you turn uh, the red light on, I think uh, you, you're pretty bright on this. This is a, a light made up by actually his former graduate student in, the, in a lot of company. And uh, ten, the other yellow light is also very bright. I think, I don't know, you can shine your face. You know. LED is very reliable, right? You don't need to change the light bulb. What do you want? It's too bright for me. But then, uh, then uh, I also went to Silicon Valley a lot, and they some some day this guy gave me this gate uh, stuff. Say, hey, you know, 
you guys are the inventor of this stuff, and uh, you want to know what this is useful? That's a backlight of, uh, that's a backlight of this, uh, the PC board or telephone, cell phone, stuff like that. How you light up your backlight, and that's what this is they doing. So, so I think uh, a lot of these people are based on your idea that we are making money, and uh, I don't think, uh, I don't think we give a lot of money to Nick yet, but uh, <laughs> thank you, Professor Honiak, for inventing that. And uh, now you see uh, some of this you can buy in a, in a, I think in a, in a shop for three dollars. You can get a pretty sharp, sharp light on that, and uh, that's a white light today. And I think, uh, and uh, the development of that is actually continues going on, and probably gonna uh, make it uh, even, even more viable for a long time. So. Uh, uh, later in 1990, there's a guy uh, did the gallium nitride uh, white light in Japan, and uh, I think in 1993, and uh, that allowed us to uh, combine the, the much uh, true blue color uh, for the for the system. So today, like I will show, if you combine a three color of LED, uh, the red which was initially developed in a green and blue, you can make any type of a combination for TV as well as uh, uh, I think all the new TV in the future are gonna base on this three color as a backlight on top of the LCD. So, uh, you know, that's gonna be a, a very good color TV on high definition, stuff like that. Sir, yeah. Do you mind it's too bright, I guess, huh? Yes, yes thank you. <laughs> Since I turned the other side, I didn't see the light direction. So uh, I think the three color is gonna be a revolution in, in not only in the traffic light, tail light of the car, and, uh, and uh, even in the architecture on the new building is all gonna be used some of this lighting system. And uh, uh, later I also learned that in a lot of biology, uh, the, the in Japan they try to uh, do red color instead of using the sun, and they're just using a red LED to shine a, a vegetable uh, to, for them to grow a particular green color of, uh, uh, since I don't know the detail, but it has a lot of write up on that. You know, it's gonna be a more color selected uh, shining photo Photo process and uh, before and, uh, and they grow a lot of vegetable using red light and uh, that's amazing to me. So uh, so as you as we can say, you know this is uh, the the reason I want to show this picture is because uh, this show uh, in people, you know, a good invention is in nineteen in nineteen sixty two, and uh, today is the year two thousand five. And you can see that 40 years later, and this is gonna be changing the world on a lamp, right? So the process you can look at, uh, you know, in the future is gonna be continue to grow. And why this is so important to tell you is, is take uh, that long and uh, take uh, so many infrastructure to build and to eventually gonna be become over several hundred billion dollars business in the world, right? So. So you can see the small invention in earlier day and was predict gonna be uh, go straight, uh, similar to transistor revolution of the world on that. So this is extremely exciting for all of us to know uh, in the solid state and semiconductor device physics on that. So uh, later, I think uh, transition from LED to laser, I think we we find out uh, people be able to incorporate the stimulant emission process into a cavity and uh, in a direct bank of semiconductor. So that results in the first semiconductor laser in 1962. And uh, uh, there's uh, four different group actually uh, made a laser uh, at the same time. And uh, the only one group made the visible laser, that's Professor Honiak. At that time he was in the General Electric. Uh, that's a uh, that's his second job. The first job he did at a PMP and switch. 
And the second job he did was he invented a semiconductor glaze and LED. So at a what uh, age? How old are you, Nick? 30? <laughs> I'm a beginner. Okay. <laughs> but a little older than you folks. Well, yeah, it's not that much older than you guys have. But, no, uh, but, but I came to a place like this and then, yes. and then you go to a place like that. Yeah, actually, Nick graduated from here and the John Bardeen, so we, and also uh, get a degree. Uh, from BS degree here. You are a very good school for you Stop to come. For a second. Yeah. Uh, this, this place didn't exist, this building. But that apparatus existed, and so I watched an experiment <laughs> that, that used that apparatus. So this is a very important place. It's a good place to come to. So a uh, semiconductor was invented, but uh, you know, the, the initial semiconductor laser was actually uh, at the low temperature. I think it's not at room temperature. So eventually, uh, we have heterojunction laser, which is in 1970. Uh, people, Herbert Cromer and Afirov, proposed that uh, you can trap this uh, electron hole, allow them to uh, get a more recombination process. So because of that, they'd be able to make a room temperature operation. So the earlier laser, 62, is a low temperature operation. And uh, eight years later, they make a room temperature operation. And for that work, uh, they receive a Nobel Prize for, for making, uh, because everybody wants a room temperature operation because they don't want to cool the temperature down. But fundamental phenomena are already discovered in 1962, and they just make it a better head of structure to trap the electron hole. Milton, please stop again yeah. because it might be interesting for you to know. Kilby got his uh, undergraduate education here at the end of World War II, and Al Kurov spent 1970-71 here uh, as a visiting scientist. Mm -hmm. So through two of those three have an Illinois connection, this place. Very exciting. We've seen uh, people uh, come from here, get the uh, Nobel Prize. Actually, Al Kurov back here twice to give a talk. So, so, okay, so those guys got Nobel Prize already, right? So, uh, what we're doing nowadays, uh, we'll be able to make in a very fast transistor in the world, and uh, uh, we have a lot of supporting from uh, Department of Defense, actually, uh, Advanced Project Agency, and uh, which pumped in about $13 million uh, into, uh, into uh, University of Illinois, Vitesse, and BAE system to develop uh, actually the very fast transistor and circuit. And, uh, and uh, we fortunately will be able to make a world fastest transistor and circuit on that. So uh, in, uh, in uh, earlier this year and two years ago, we uh, clicked the transistor speed over 600 gigahertz and uh, it's continuing going to be increased. And we're also working closely with Vitesse to develop an integrated circuit and to provide them the transistor technology into an integrated circuit. So we made a, also the world fastest uh, circuit, which is 152 gigahertz of flip-flop. And uh, you know, people don't realize you have to study a lot to make the device work because uh, it's no longer just a semiconductor, it's also electromagnetic wave uh, transport at the gigahertz frequency range on that. So, so by doing that, uh, what was one day I told uh, Professor Honig, say, Hey, you know, we got this very fast transistor. Uh, most of the time, probably Nick just uh, ignore me because, yeah, that's a big deal. Right? Uh, <laughs> the only thing uh, was a big deal to him was his current density. Uh, the speed was not really bother him a lot, but uh, when he looked, at his current density was 1.3 mega m per centimeter square. He was very excited. Right, because he took this number and divided by beta, he got 20 kilo m per centimeter square, and he immediately realized you can generate laser light in a transistor. So Nick was not excited I got a world record of speed. He was excited about the, what was uh, next after the world record on the speed. So that idea was come from him, and uh, then, then I drink coffee with him, so most of the time, you know, he just asks you a few questions. Any light come out of this HBT? And 
And uh, the, the first time I look, yeah, this crazy old guy. And, and, uh, so we say, yeah, okay, you know, we look at it, we look at it. So first experiment, I used a wrong detector. So I couldn't find the light because I was in the wrong wavelengths, right? So, so I, sh I go back, drink a couple more coffee with Nick, I shake hand. I couldn't find the light. <laughs> you know, but I didn't tell him that. But then two months later, you know, I find a wrong detector. So we figure out the right detector and then we find the light out. So basically, in April 2003, we discovered this uh, light output that changes the structure on the transistor. Now, we have a transistor original. We have input and uh, we electrical amplified output. Now, we suddenly be able to trap the optical output here. And uh, what's important here is basically we recognize that it can be a signal rather than just uh, the light. It actually can be a signal. Now that's important, right? You get electrical input, optical output, electrical output on the system now, right? So instead of a regular transistor, now you discover you can have a transistor and have a light output at the same time, and that's open up an important uh, uh, opportunity, right? So, uh, so the next thing to do is how do you improve the efficiency of the device? So I go to go back to drink more coffee with Nick again, you know, and uh, so you have to drink a lot of coffee to get a good idea. <laughs> so uh, actually in earlier day when I was a graduate student, Professor Honig's group developed the first quantum wire laser, right? The first quantum wire laser was actually developed uh, at the University of Illinois in 1977, and uh, today all the laser and the LEDs make on quantum wire laser, uh, quantum well concept. So we take the regular transistor, incorporate quantum well concept in a device, we become a quantum well uh, light emitting transistor, and uh, so we can chop a lot of light and be able to uh, make a, a very useful device out of it. So you can see that, you know, today we'll be able to show this is a device you made without uh, current flow. When you current flow it, you can see the six spots of the light is coming out, and this is intensity coming out. And uh, you can see that it's, uh, uh, you know, it's going to be a very interesting uh, device can be controlled by a three-terminal transistor today. So what's next? Obviously, uh, you go back, drink more coffee with Nick, and uh, he told you, why don't you make a laser out of it? You know, so, and, uh, you know, so after a cup of coffee, we a couple more months later, in July 2004, we demonstrated the first transistor laser, which is uh, with a lot of uh, hard-working graduates doing and the postdoc, and uh, they made it possible. So that's the first three-terminal laser and also the first transistor laser. Uh, I think uh, I don't want to do all this, but this is the first laser. You don't need to look output as a laser. <laughs> You can simply look at electrical property of the device on the transistor curve, and you know there's a laser already exists because it transitioned from a, a transistor state in here into a stimulant emission process, and the, the, laser, the, the, the electrical property change on that, and uh, that's produced an amini effect of the device. So we copper the laser into a fiber you can see that this is a laser beam. This is a semiconductor laser. This is a fiber here. You can see the laser was shooting into the fiber, and it had a 3 gigahertz of modulation speed on the system on that. So what is that useful? Because uh, today, all the, all the microprocessor chip and uh, everything else today is eventually going to be limited, up, limited by the optical interface, interface right? Because uh, you can have an internal very fast uh, switching speed, but you cannot uh, uh, transfer the data out. So to get over 100 gigabits per second uh, uh, connection, you need an optical interconnect. So DAPA decided to give us uh, $6.5 million at the University of Illinois to study and work on this problem today. So we continue to do more invention in this area. So what is the invention process? Uh, required to do is uh, 
carefully examine data and I a problem. Uh, devoted effort, you gotta have a devoted effort in a science and technology. Choose a field so you become a true expert, not just uh, about it. Uh, discussion with uh, people and drinking coffee also. Or strong and invention was started. So in conclusion, I think uh, I'm very fortunately uh, I a great people and uh, like uh, the, the great like uh, Professor Honiak who invented LED laser, quantum wire laser, impurity disorder, and uh, oxide confined laser. And uh, I also very appreciate uh, all the graduate students and uh, who uh, help possible for making this happen. So I just want you guys to know, uh, young mind, that uh, this is very rich field for physics, engineering, that uh, we all uh, discover something every day. And uh, thank you. Now the question is basically uh, LED is uh, the the light is diverging, so so you can only have a certain distance on that. Uh, uh, is the LED can replace LED to do that? Uh, the answer is no. I think LED is more to how to control a high speed monitor and uh, do some display, but you can get in a different angle of focus. But LED do not use all electron hole pair in the to uh, light up the system. It's only using the fast uh, electron hole pair to manipulate the system. Yeah. Uh, what wavelengths are you measuring out of LED? Like what? Uh, currently, we'd be able to get the uh, red color, and we'd be able to, uh, that's 650 nanometer, and we'd be able to get an infrared, which is uh, 850 to 1,000 uh, 1, nanometer. Uh, I think we'd be able to get a 1.6 micron deep infrared. So it's a material system dependent. You, that's why it's very exciting. Uh, this You can do all different material. And I think uh, that's why there's a lot of research going on, how to carry on on that. Yes. Uh, okay, the hole is a, a empty state of electron. I mean, uh, uh, when there's an electron there, uh, in the valence band, uh, well, I shouldn't use that word. There's a quantum state there. If an uh, electron is not occupied there, then there's empty state there. And uh, so in, in a semiconductor, you have a valence band have all uh, electron occupy the state. But if you take a couple of electrons out of there, you become an empty state. Then the electron in the, em electron in the valence band can move around and look like a hole is moving. And so that's the hole. the hole. The hole in a crystal is very real. It's as real as an electron is. Yeah. And if, if, if we go talk to, I don't know if Kevin is a high energy physicist, but there are high energy physicists in here, and they'll tell you if they stop energy at about two million electron volts, they get an electron out of out of the vacuum, and they get a positron, which is a positive electron, like a positive electron. And they, they got a different name for it. In a crystal, it's atoms, 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 but all tied together with electrons. And if it's a neutral crystal like that, in essence, there's nothing conducting. In a copper wire, there are free electrons that move around and conduct. But in a crystal, semiconductor crystal, we've got, if we yank loose one of those electrons, it can conduct, and the place it left behind is a hole. And the readjustment of negative carriers there, electrons, allows that hole to propagate. It's as real, it's a, it's a positive hunk of charge, just like the electron is a negative one. So we're masters of using electrons to conduct
conduct and holes to conduct. And then, as Professor Fing has pointed out, the electron is up here in energy, the hole is down here, and when one annihilates the other, out comes a photon. You can play games with electrons, conducting, holes conducting, positive, and photons, which are useful in cells, but useful also in the further electronic. The young man has asked a good question about where are we in, in wavelengths. Every, every system that he's able to build one of these transistors in is a, is a different place and a different wavelength, and all of those have to be explored. That's all work for young people. I'm getting too old to do that. The, the, the young people <laughs> sitting here have got to do some of that and answer some of those questions, and, and Professor will make them do it. He'll crack the whip on them to make them do it. <laughs> so we got a couple of people here that can explain that to you, how that works. Yes. 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 At what scale? The 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 obviously uh, the question is that do you get a heat build up? The answer is yes, uh, because uh, uh, the power basically is a current time voltage. So for given device, if you take a current time the voltage, you get a power, and that power going to translate into heat on the device. So in this type of device, obviously you need. Uh, uh, much more sophisticated compared to a LED, right? That's why uh, to make a transistor laser, the room temperature is a big deal because you finally be able to demonstrate that's possible to do it. And uh, I think uh, uh, today the technology is much more sophisticated. We can remove the heat from the top very quickly, so-called thermal shunt effect. Hi, Paul. Semiconductors are all over the place in properties. Germanium and silicon is not a good candidate because the electron sits over here in momentum, the hole over here, so it's not a good light emitter, nor silicon. Though they do emit some light, so there's some interesting games to play there. But the ones, the crystals that he uses for HBTs, they're direct gap, the electron sits in momentum over the hole, so all the crystals we make lasers and lamps and, and so forth out of are all direct crystals. And of course, it's a big problem to know how to do all that, learn all of that, and it, there is no boundary between the physics, the materials, the chemistry, the electronics. Uh, John Bardeen had two uh, Nobel Prizes in physics, but he also had a bachelor's and a master's degree in, in electrical engineering, but was it a, a supremely good person in mathematics and in physics, and ultimately became a renowned theoretical physicist. Incidentally, there, were, there was another Nobel Prize in the same field in chemistry, an English one. And there, there, there are four double Nobel Prize winners in history. And Bardeen was the only one that was the twice physicist, an Englishman was the twice chemist, Madame Curie was chemistry and physics, and Linus Pauling was chemistry and peace. peace prize. Mm -hmm. So you can see how unique Bardeen was. Obviously one of the greatest physicists of the 20th century. And, and, and left his effect on everybody, including all of you sitting here, every one of you that has a grandmother or grandfather or father with a pacemaker <laughs> or a computer or your ignition in your car or, every, or the MRI and everything else, this electronic you use today can, can't be done. It ain't possible with boots, and it's a heat problem, is a big, big, well, everything is limited by heat ultimately. It's always general heat, always general heat. Yes? What sort of applications to the transistor lasers are uh, I think you ask a very good question now. What is the uh, application, I think? <laughs> My answer to you. <laughs> uh, I think uh, you had to visualize this. Uh, we transfer from a two-port operation into a three-port operation, and that export going to be open up a lot of uh, new application. People are going to use it, and uh, you know, you just think about it. You have electrical input, you have uh, electrical output, like a regular transistor, and you got an optical output now, and that can give you one additional. Uh, play game on the system. So 
uh, there's been a lot of uh, uh, question on how all the next generation application going to be look like. Basically, this may be the uh, ideal device for the optical electronics integrated circuit. Because before you get an electrical integrated circuit, but you cannot do optical output very quickly. So this is a private form of the device. Okay, you ask a two questions. Okay. <laughs> Yes, yeah. Detect is a reverse process of uh, optical process. So uh, if you do a detector in terms of vertical one, you do a waveguide one, then you will be fast enough. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, we we did a both. Uh, both both techniques can be used. Uh, 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 MOCVD, right? We use a lot of MOCVD because it's uh, commercial available. Also, depend on who you're working for. But we also doing on MBE. But uh, MBE sometimes non equilibrium grow. There's uh, you you get a some non radiative uh, light problem. But it should be able to work both ways. Once the people figure out. Let, let's, let's stop there. Those were some great questions. For those of you who might want to learn a little bit more, uh, talk with Professor Fang a little bit more, uh, we encourage you to come down afterwards. But uh, thank you all for coming today. Thank you very much, Professor Fang.